Uh, hey guys, it's good to be back with you in our uh, real-time segments that we're putting together and I hope that you tuned in and you heard Dr. Ken Johnson um, and uh, you can look his uh, information up, biblefacts.org uh, and also uh, the segment that we did, it's uploaded onto YouTube and you have to kind of look through it but you can find it there and, uh, and hopefully you'll listen to it. I think it was very informative. Uh, talking about the rapture and a, a variety of other things also. But we have our main Bible teacher back with us today, and that's uh, Pastor Buzz down there in Virginia. And um, we're so excited because we want to continue on our journey uh, as we've uh, kind of walked our way through chronologically uh, the book of Revelation and, and the end time scenario. So uh, I'm glad that you're tuning in, and uh, Buzz, I'm certainly glad that you're back on the phone here with us today. Well, it's good to be back with you, and I just want to take just a moment and thank you guys for doing this. There are so many questions out there uh, from people, I mean, people that I meet who have questions about the things concerning the end times. It seems like all the events that are going on, um, their hearts and their, and their minds are focused on hey, this is different. This is something they've never experienced before. Right. Or are we living in, in the last days? So this has been very, uh, very timely. It's, uh, so I just wanted to thank you guys for doing this. Well, we appreciate you coming and taking your time. Do you see, look, I know there's violence and I know there's rebellion and outpouring of it. And uh, again, just to uh, say for our listening audience, um, you know, uh, as a country, we embrace the idea of being able to protest. We, uh, listen, our country was founded on the principle of protesting, so we certainly would be hypocritical if we didn't embrace the idea of protesting. I think any, any people who have freedom and have liberty have a um, right and an obligation to protest uh, if something's not the way they want it. We have a government that's set up, a republic, by the way, not a, we're not a democracy as much as we are a republic. And uh, we have the right to do this, and I, so I admire people who will protest. And I think I, I speak on behalf of Buzz, myself, uh, you know, and everyone here, that obviously what we watched a police officer uh, do out in Minnesota, uh, Minneapolis in particular, was not only egregious, it was, um, it was just terrible, terrible thing to watch. And um, he needs to face justice, which you know he is going to face justice over this, or I, at least he is. At least I hope he's facing justice over this. And um, um, I, I, I can't help but think that um, um, I, I would hope, like given circumstances, again he would be smart enough not to do it over again. But the the truth is, he did it, and he needs to uh, suffer the consequences for it. There's no doubt about it. Um, and I do believe, again, that the people have a right to go out and to march and to uh, raise awareness. I do also believe, though, you, you'd be hard-pressed to find many people that would side with the egregious action that that police officer took. And by the way, this is not to besmirch every police officer. I, I for one, believe uh, most of the police officers we run across and we deal with, um, we have a good relationship with the police officers in our town here. and. Um, I actually serve as a chaplain for a police department. So I certainly know of many police officers that are uh, people of integrity. Um, but I do believe they have a right to be protested when something like this happens. But when this Antifa group comes in, and Buzzy, I'm gonna lead you to a question here, so please listen. Um, sure. When Antifa, which is a supposed anti-fascist organization, which is nothing but a lie, um, it is funded by by uh, terrible people, and um, they're doing nothing but stirring up. Do you think, um, because of the times we're in, and I know you believe like I do, if this is not the last of the last days, this is certainly a dress rehearsal. Does it seem to you that violence and rebellion get stirred up more uh, around, um, when we see things going on around us like this? Is it just being stirred up? I mean, Satan is the prince of power of the air. He loves anarchy and he loves confusion um why don't you speak to that for one moment well i think well evil is always there i mean we know that right um uh, we see it locally we see it nationally I mean, evil is always there and it's inherent and it's sort of underground but when things like this happen that evil that was already there it just kind of pops 
to the top, and then so it, it becomes visible. But I agree with you that the protests, uh, I agree with 100%. The violence, I do not. Um, but that's evil, again, whenever, whenever there's anything good that happens, evil will always rear its ugly head. And even during these protests, I, I, I believe that probably the majority of the protests are peaceful. Right. We had a protest here in Lynchburg uh, several nights ago, and uh, it was a lot of churches getting together, black and white, and they had a praise and worship service. Isn't that awesome? People were praying, people were praying and people were uh, singing praises to God, black and white, all colors, joining hands, raising hands. You know, wait a second, before. Buzzy. How come I didn't read about this? Exactly. If the media would focus in on events like this, I think it would go a long way in quelling the violence that we see. But that doesn't sell paper, so to speak. It doesn't draw eyes. You know, they want to focus in on the violence and the burning and looting, yeah. uh, which is wrong that's going on. But I'll tell you what, there's a lot more peaceful protests going on. And uh, I just wish, and it's my prayer, that the media would begin to focus in on those things instead of the negative things that we're seeing. You're right. How about, how about you lead us in a word of prayer and we'll pray about these whole protests and what's going on out there. How about you lead us in a word of prayer? Sure. Father, I, I believe, Lord, that, that you are in the midst of doing something good, Father, and always out of evil, Lord, something good happens, Lord. And this is my prayer, Father, that out of this, Lord, the negative that has happened, the negative that is happening on both sides, Lord, of this debate, yes, Father, that you would use for your good. Father, wake the church up, Lord. Father, wake believers up as individuals, Lord, uh, to realize, Father, that we are indeed approaching these last days, Father. We can't just sit back on our laurels. We can't sit back and do nothing, Father. We have to use the talents and gifts and abilities, Lord, that you have given us, Lord, to reach out to people in love and tell them about the gospel of your son, Jesus Christ. So, Father, that's what I pray for this. Lord, I pray that you would overrule, Lord, all of the negative that's going on. Yes. I pray, Father, that you would frustrate, Lord, the wisdom of the wicked, Lord, who are operating behind the scenes here, and that your good would come out of this, Father. Mm -hmm. Lord, Lord, I pray for revival. Yes. Lord, I pray that you would revive the hearts of your people, God's people, Father. That's where revival begins, in the church, Lord, in individuals' hearts, Lord, the believers, Lord. And I pray that it spreads from there, Lord. Yes. And the media will have no choice but to focus in all the good <laughs> Amen. that is going on as a result of you, Father. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Bless our time today in your precious name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you, Buzzy. And um, obviously, uh, if you have any more questions about anything along those lines, feel free to contact us here at the church. We'd love to talk to you. And quite honestly, I would love to... Uh, to be able to gather together with some of my brothers, um, um, some of my African-American brothers and some pastors, a dear friend of mine, Mark Abrams over in Philadelphia, pastor of Calvary Chapel over there, he had asked me to pray. He was, he's in the thick of it in the, in the middle of the city. And um, he said it was just crazy a few nights ago. So um, let's just pray that, you know, a peace will rule. And, uh, but we know, and getting into the end time scenario here, Buzzy, not, True peace is never going to be here until Christ comes and rules. And even at the end of his rule here on earth, there's going to be a war. So let's, let's start in on our track today. And uh, if by my calculations, uh, we have kind of gone through uh, the first two sets. Now we're on to the third set, which is known as the bowls or the vials. We've kind of talked about Antichrist setting himself up. I think we kind of worked our way through a couple of the woes and so forth. So let's pick up if we can, and let's talk about the bowls or the vials. I don't know which you refer to them as, but um, uh, we'll talk about those. And I think we wanna kind of talk a little bit maybe about the judgments that Christians and non-Christians are going to face at the uh, along this journey also. So uh, I, are you comfortable picking up then uh, as we talk about the bowls or the vials? That would be great. Um, I believe at this point, if we're following chronologically, yeah, right that we're well into the last three and a half years. You remember the, uh, at the midway point, you know, that's where the warfare happens in heaven. Satan comes down, the 
Antichrist suffers his fatal wound. I believe that the Antichrist is raised up by Satan himself. And so now during these last three and a half years, you not only have the wrath of God, these bold judgments that we're going to be talking about, against the Antichrist and against unsaved mankind uh, who have refused to respond to his repeated calls for repentance. Yes. And you have the wrath of Satan against Israel and against all believers who have taken the mark of God. And so you talk about hell on earth, and you have the wrath of God and the wrath of Satan happening all at once. And I think about this, you know, I think about how today, you know, with, we've had the coronavirus, and now we have um, the, the riots and looting going on, and people are so upset, and people are afraid, and they're fearful. I'm thinking, this is nothing, oh, nothing no. right. compared to what it's going to be like these last half years talking about being fearful of something that is completely out of your control that's these last three and a half years here without a doubt and um and as the scripture clearly states to us and by the way revelation what 16 i think is probably sort of the quintessential of getting us through these through these bowls and viral uh, viral vials um but it starts off in verse one and it makes it very clear to us this is the wrath of God being poured out now these vials are definitely the wrath of God but I agree with you Satan is doing Satan knows time is short at that point he knows what is to come he's tried everything it's kind of like the boxer who's thrown every punch he can possibly throw um, he's done all that he can he knows he's gonna be defeated but he's gonna go down doing just with whatever he's got left he's gonna go down yet we know that he really isn't a contender in the fight because uh, Satan is not a contender to God. I mean, God would put a whisper could annihilate Satan. Um, but we do know that Satan hates mankind and he certainly hates God's children. So it certainly fits the narrative that he's doing that. So how about we start breaking this down? Let's look at these bowls or, um, do you refer to them as the viral vials or do you refer to them as bowls, Buzz? Well, I'm a big cereal guy, so I have a big cereal bowl. <laughs> so I refer to these as bowls. You know, this one, I, so you're I, you're I you're a cereal killer. I could take it then. Is that what you're telling yeah. me? You eat a lot of cereal. There is, there is not a bad cereal out there. I mean, I, from Captain Crunch to Fruit Berries, I mean, they're all good. The only ones I don't like are the ones that get soggy real quick. They gotta stay a little crunchy. Uh, so I'm a Crunch Berry yeah, fan. I have a little problem with those grape nuts too. Remember that old cereal? Oh before? yeah, trust me. I, I <laughs> <laughs> so please let's continue. Um, yeah, man, but, but anyway, these are and, and like you said, these are the seven bowls of the wrath of God. That's something you don't want to be in front of. No. Um, uh, and so the announcement is made there in chapter 16, which is where these. I got a question for you though, real quick with that, you know, something I, and this is one that people have differing opinions because it tells us there that a loud voice is heard from the temple. Now back in chapter 15, somewhere in chapter 15, it, it tells us that at that point, no one was allowed in the temple, uh, only God was there. So is this loud voice God saying this? I mean, who else would it be? Well, I, I believe it's God, and it's not God, it's certainly directed by God, because all of his created beings do nothing but the bid of God, and so if it's not his voice, and if it's coming from the temple, you would think that that's where it would, would be. It's interesting that you mentioned the temple here, because you remember the earthly temple, or the earthly tabernacle, was just an image of what already is in heaven. Amen. And so we're seeing, and you see this throughout the book of Revelation. By the way, let me give a plug here real quick. Buzzy and I, uh, for those of you out there, we're talking about continuing this series when we're done with Revelation by talking about the uh, going from uh, the tabernacle to the temple. And I think it would be nice to culminate with the new heaven, new earth, with, with the temple, with no need for it, all the other things that go along with it. So be looking for that. I think Buzz and I are going to continue conversations focused on Christ uh, in the tabernacle and the temple and so forth and the end time uh, scenario of that. So please go ahead, Buzz. It's, it's, uh, it's such an exciting topic and, uh, and we see it throughout the whole Bible. God wouldn't have put it there if there wasn't a meaning to it. Yeah. And, uh, and so we see a lot of allusions to it in Hebrews and especially here in Revelation, which is the original copy of the temple and tabernacle and so we see references to that 
uh, time and time again. And so this voice that comes out from the, the, the heavenly temple there and tells the angels, in other words, gives the angels permission. Now, these angels, perhaps maybe they were created for just this time. Right. Maybe they've been holding these bowls, you know, since they were created, getting ready for God to say, you know, here it is, the time is right now. When God says so, hold that bowl, you hold that bowl. That's right. That's, right. that's <laughs> what I do when I put cereal in. I'll tell you, it doesn't stay still very long. You need to go away and get a bowl of cereal, I understand. <laughs> well, I know, I'm getting a hunger, I get yeah. hunger pain. Yeah. But anyway, this first bowl, uh, God just poured out these seven bowls of God's wrath on the earth. Now, this is something that John is just not looking and seeing this vision in heaven. He's seeing it now poured out onto the earth. Verse 2 says, the fourth angel, or the first angel does this, pours out his bowls on the land, and, and all of a sudden, ugly and painful sores broke out on the people. But interesting, only on the people who had the mark of the beast and worshiped his image. So what does that tell you? That there are believers alive yes. still during this time. Right. There's this vast underground church who has survived everything up to this point. But all of a sudden now, this, this bowl is empty, and all of a sudden these ugly and painful sores festering and, and cancerous and uh, malignant and foul and ugly. Report. I mean, now let me ask you a question, Buzzy. Let me ask you this question, then let's let's delve a little bit into that under the surface. And uh, talking about this mark of the beast, which the people desire to get, they want this because they know that that's pledging allegiance to the Antichrist. They know that by taking that mark, they're pledging allegiance. And uh, we hear a, we hear a wide variety of what that mark's going to look like, what it's going to be. We're given a few clues about it. We're told that it's the number of man, that it's his number, um, 666, meaning that I believe that it's talking about the, the total uh, numerical value. Um, you know, Hebrew, of course, and Greek, uh, they have a, a numerical value to, to letters. We don't, but they do. And so um, they will take this as allegiance, but of course he's going to say, this is the, my this is my identification mark that you are you are loyal to me, and because you're loyal to me, do you have any any thoughts on that mark, what it's going to mean? I know it talks about the right hand. I know it talks about the forehead. Do you have any thoughts on that mark? Well, chapter 13 of Revelation talks about that. It, it's, it's to be placed on the right hand or the forehead. Now, is that symbolic? Because we know that uh, the Israelites would put scriptures on their wrists and they would put it around their foreheads. Now, is, is it just something symbolic or is it something that's visible? I believe it's visible. I, re I really do. Right. Here's a question. Uh, once you have that mark, can it be erased? Um, well, can, can, I, yeah, can, I don't think can so. You re can you respond to God at that point? Or are you so far, far gone have you sold your soul to Satan, so to speak, at that point when you received the mark? I don't have, we don't read in Revelation that people have the mark erased. It either you have the mark or you don't. And uh, those who do have the mark, then of course are able to buy and sell and, and, and to, as normal as you can, proceed with life with advantage. I, I think uh, it's and, kind of strange, right? I think you bring up a great question. I, you know, we, we, we have a hard time Trying to figure, I know there's a lot of TV shows and everything that talk about an apocalyptical world, you know, a uh, Book of Eli kind of things and others that escape my mind. But, you know, we don't understand. Like, usually in, with human mankind, there's always a black market, you know. So, will some of these people be able to survive because they were vast preppers, uh, because other people feel some sympathy for them uh, because they had silver and gold they were able to buy food and those types of things on a black market i mean you think about how difficult it is going to be for those people who call themselves believers to survive because like you said we're in the latter portion now of of uh the tribulation period and these people would have had to survive this thing for a while how in the world were they able to survive and i for some reason I have read, and I'll have to look it up, I apologize, but I will look it up, about those who receive the mark, uh, can they turn from that? I, for, for some reason, I do not believe you can. I believe that once you take that mark, you are, 
you are now um, destined to be a follower of Antichrist, and you're not going to be able to change that. Um, I, kind of, I kind of agree with you on that. Uh, I think in the first three and a half years, you probably did have that black market underground and underneath because what was happening there mostly was antichrist doing so it would be easy to hide and get away with things but now we're talking about hiding from god which right. no one can do you're right you know and and so if you have that mark this vial or this bowl i mean you are a mark man i mean literally at this point uh, you will have these sores now i don't know about you but if i was a believer during this time if I saw only those who had the mark uh, with all of these sores, I would have a tendency to want to stay a believer. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because I would want that happening to me. And so, if you can imagine, there's no partying going on here. No. Uh, you know how when you have something that hurts, and you've been able to identify with this, you don't want to be out celebrating and, and partying. And a lot of people say, well, during the tribulation, I'm just going to be partying with my friends. I don't think so. No, well, listen, you and I have gone over the other judgments. I mean, there's darkness. Uh, a third of the waters, uh, and we're going to find out now here in a little bit, up to now what a third of the waters have been affected. This is not a party atmosphere. For, I think the reason they partied the death of the two uh, witnesses was because they felt like these witnesses were bringing all these things upon them. They're dead and gone. And that the only reason they celebrated by giving gifts is they felt like ding dong the witch is dead you know what i mean and mm -hmm. so yep. i think what they're finding out now because god is very much taking the knob of the oven and he's just turning the temperature up more and more you know you think about it people people at this time have been suffering tremendously and you bring up a tremendous point who in the world wants to go out and party who in the world thinks they're going to celebrate in their sin when things are so rotten completely gone i mean and a lot of it in darkness and everything else i mean this is a this is a frightful time like we said before men's hearts mighty men's hearts will be failing them so this is not a party time that's for sure well I, and again these judgments are being needed out against unsaved mankind yeah. but at the same time you have satan and the antichrist meeting out his judgment against saved mankind and Israel and so you've got I mean nobody escapes this you can imagine being a believer during this time and, and you know during the, the Holocaust and you know hiding you know we read about uh, the hiding place and those who were here to, you know, to escape the yeah. SS and and how frightened they were I mean this will be believers during you're not going to be out in, in the open street corner preaching the gospel no. you're going to be hiding and um, a part of that so, is let's face it when men are taken to the apex of their depravity, when men are, are just absolutely in their most vile, debased minds, and that's what's gonna go on here. I mean, you're talking about people starving to death, you're talking about uh, people just doing the most depraved things uh, to one another at this time. You know, um, no, listen, we watched history that shows man knows no limitation uh, in their, in their imaginations of evil and wickedness you know nothing will be so evil and nothing will be so wicked that they won't do it so you're right who's gonna like as a believer you think well you should go out and minister to these people with sores no you shouldn't this is going to be mm -hmm. this is going to be animalistic is what it's going to be it's going to be animalistic well, these, pe these people will be angry oh these people will be angry because it's being needed out on them and again it's interesting that it says this is needed out of the people who had the mark of the beast and who worshiped his image yep. and so there's going to be a demand to worship his image those who refuse obviously are in in hiding and, and fearing for their lives and praying you know god you know come quickly come quickly oh yeah and, oh yeah uh, and, so, and this is just the first bowl i know so. i know and if we don't get going we will be right finishing up on the first bowl <laughs> we'll, be, we'll be eating cereal <laughs> 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 so let's go buddy